It's a good show. I'm, uh, it fires me to continue. Um, otherwise, if you're not too happy with it, I might feel it back on it at day. It's all the type of mood I'm in. Lee. He was as genius as he was meek, and unfortunately, as lively as he was unwilling to live. Let's explore. Lee Alexander McQueen was born on March 17, 1969 in London. The youngest of six children, he was already making dresses for his three sisters early on in childhood. His earliest fashion memory reaches back to when he was just three years old, drawing a dress on the wall of his East London family home. How were you when he knew you wanted to design clothes? Well, I'd say about three years old. Yeah. What's your first memory of it? Yeah. Um, living in this council house with uh, my sisters and my brothers and drawing this dress on a peeled wall. The paper had come off and there was a bit of bare wall and I draw this one dress. It's my earliest memory of a sketch. And do you have any, uh, any record of it at all? No, I wanted to go back and shift the cement off. You know, I know we, we sold the house years ago, but I always wanted to go back and because I know exactly still where I drew the picture. <laughs> he was also inspired by birds, which would show up in his designs later on in his career. McQueen left school at 16 in 1985 with only an O-level, or ordinary level, in art. He took a tailoring course at Newham College and went on to serve a two-year apprenticeship on coat making with Seville Row tailors Anderson and Shepard, before joining Jeeves and Hawks as a pattern cutter. He actually applied to be a tutor for pattern cutting at St. Martin's at 21, but was considered too young to be teaching students that were his peers. His portfolio was so impressive that Bobby Hilson, the head of the master's course at St. Martin's, encouraged McQueen to enroll as a student instead. Thus, the birth of McQueen as we know him today. McQueen was soon able to attract the attention of magazine editor and eccentric stylist Isabella Blow and all her fashion industry friends in high places. When he graduated with his master's degree in fashion design, there was a 1992 master's graduation collection titled Jack the Ripper Stalks His Victims, which was purchased entirely by Blow. She soon became his mentor and close friend. In fact, she convinced him to use his middle name, Alexander, in his label. This was the true birth of Alexander McQueen, the brand, as we know him today. In 1992, he launched his label out of Blow's basement in her home in Belgravia, a district in central London. Next day, I rang up and I couldn't get hold of him. And his mother said to him that was this mad woman who keeps trying to call us. I don't know to this day if he knew who I was. No, I just wanted the money. I was desperate for money. I wasn't interested in him either. I just wanted the clothes. I didn't give her no money off. I said, that's 350, love. You can take it or leave it. And, uh, and she loved that. Actually, it wasn't 350 the lot. It was 350 per piece. In 1993, he moved to a studio in Hoxton Square with the likes of other new forward-thinking designers like Hussein Chalayan and Parik Sweeney. They were also mastering their craft there. His first show was for the 1994 season featuring the Nihilism Collection. It featured low-rise pants known as the Bumpster, a common staple of his early shows. Michael Olivier Salak, the director of Blow PR and a friend of McQueen said, the Bumpster for me is what defined McQueen. The show also featured some models looking bruised and bloody. Journalist Marion Hume of The Independent described it as theater of cruelty and a horror show. Immediately, he gained a reputation that would sell instantly. Controversial, shocking, and beautifully tailored. The French would dub him Terrible Child and the Hooligan of English Fashion. His subsequent second show also made a splash in fashion as well. I've always wondered where your fascination for the macabre comes from. I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I, think, I think it's a very sad thing, but a melancholic thing, but I think it's a very romantic thing because it, it means an end of a cycle and everything has an end. And uh, I think uh, 
the cycle of life is, you know, is it, it, a positive thing because it gives room for new things to come behind you. So. The Banshee is where he met his right-hand woman and official second opinion, Katie England. His third show, The Birds, was named after the Hitchcock film, a running theme in his work. It was his fourth show, Highland, that would truly set him apart, not just for fall 1995, but for the rest of his life and career. This is what made him peerless in the industry. This is a true highlight in the infamously signature stylings of McQueen. His fourth runway show for his autumn winter collection of 95 brought him to the world's stage. This is the most attention that he had gotten thus far and it would cement his legacy in fashion history forever. The collection's title refers to the Highland Clearances of Scotland, and was, yet again, deemed controversial for Lee. Some models on the runway were clothes that were slashed and torn and in tatters of lace with splatters of fake blood. This wasn't just forward thinking for the industry at the time, this was something that truly pissed a lot of people off. Well done. Reviewers have interpreted it as being about women who were taken advantage of and criticized that they saw it as misogyny and the glamorization of attack. McQueen objected to such interpretation, arguing that it referred to England's attack of Scotland and was intended to counter other designers' romantic depiction of Scottish culture. It was certainly seen as more than kilts after this shock show. As for the charge of misogyny, he said he aimed to empower women and for people to be afraid of the women he dressed. But in reality, they were afraid of the man behind the looks. From 1996 to 2001, Alexander McQueen also designed as the creative director for Givenchy. Of course, much like in his own label, he pushed the boundaries with what people normally considered fashionable. He featured an amputee as a model down the catwalk to rave reviews and revulsion. Although the work was beautiful, Lee felt his time there was pretty much wasted. Lee was initially reluctant and later reflected on his tenure, stating that the job constrained his creativity. I treated Givenchy badly. It was just money to me, but there was nothing I could do. The only way it would have worked would have been if they had allowed me to change the whole concept of the house to give it a new identity, and they never wanted me to do that. Of one of his best and most memorable of his time at Givenchy was spring 1997, Haute Couture. What a debut. The next major revolutionary show was also easily one of the most memorable and iconic runway shows in fashion history. In fact, to several fashion journalists, it was his magnum opus. Spring 1999, a show of legendary proportions that featured supermodel Shalom Harlow being spray painted by a robot. Nothing like this has really been done since. McQueen was inspired by artist Rebecca Horn's 1991 installation, High Moon, for which two guns shot blood red paint at one another. It elevated the art form of performance art on the runway in a way that would be referenced by several designers for years to come. He continued to use unconventional models to his aesthetic advantage. I wouldn't swap these people I've been working with for a supermodel. They'd got so much dignity and there's not a lot of dignity in high fashion. Alexander McQueen Spring 2001 featured one of his favorite muses, Erin O'Connor, and veteran supermodel, Kate Moss, in the swan-like Birds of Ballet runway show. This is certainly one of his more definitive shows of his career up there with Spring 99. Featured in this thumbnail is from Fall 2009. I found the photo so indicative of a designer and his models and the heat of runway chaos. He was hands-on and there was so much 
to watch, just to watch these women evolve into something, to transform into more than just models and to bring image to his life in the most avant-garde and wonderful way. It really was its own form of entertainment. It was certainly more than just your standard run-of-the-mill, up-and-down-the-catwalk runway show. Plus, the overdrawn red lips are hands down my personal favorite piece of imagery from any McQueen show, and that's saying a lot. He's done a lot of iconic imagery. Around this time, there was a fresh avant-garde pop star who just had an energy, an aesthetic, that felt just as futuristic and nostalgic as McQueen's, and it was no wonder that they got along so well artistically. A new, young Lady Gaga served as his short-lived muse right up until his passing. Bad Romance featured his designs, and he played the song at his Plato's Atlantis Spring 2010 show for the finale. She also wore McQueen after his passing at the 2010 VMAs. She recently wore an archive McQueen dress from the fall 1995 Highland show and a headpiece from his spring 1997 La Pope show. She definitely has benefited from Lee's iconography. He took his own life shortly after the death of his mother. He also lost his mentor and dear friend Isabella Blow. These events changed him forever. There couldn't have been a softer and kinder human being behind such gruesome and beautiful imagery. May he rest. Subscribe to join the U-Universe.